Good morning, brethren. Happy Sabbath. It's nice to be with you back in the St. Pete area. Just uh, we were in Fort Myers last week, and the brethren down there send their greetings. Well, brethren, coming back from the Feast of Tabernacles, celebrating that festival, but yet also celebrating God's entire feast plan throughout the years through his holy days, we're able to rehearse this wonderful plan of salvation that God has for mankind, but also to be able to reflect on the jobs and the responsibilities that God is going to give us in his kingdom. The question that comes to mind is, can we trust God that he is going to fulfill everything he says he's going to do? And I think we can all agree that, yes, God will fulfill it. And we know that it's through God's Holy Spirit that gives us the faith to be able to put our confidence in him. We also know that God is going to be with us wherever we are, whether it's going to be good or bad times. Whatever those situations are, he's never going to leave us and he's never going to forsake us. And he allows us sometimes to go through very difficult, hard times so that we can become stronger in our faith towards him. And we can learn how to put all of our confidence in him. It doesn't really come natural for us because our human nature sometimes gets in the way. But we must desire to learn all that we can about God and his perfect righteousness so that we're able to apply all of these lessons that we learn in our life to where we can one day be able to teach. It's about living this way of life, this hope that is in us, which is the plan of God, the salvation of man, and that God desires for man. So, brethren, let's begin this study by turning to the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, picking up in verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we see that God is the one who works through us for his purpose, for his will. He has called us. And I know you have heard me say this many times. It is a very special calling doesn't mean that we were special from the world, but God has called us. He didn't call the people of the world. He didn't call your neighbors. And in some cases, he didn't call anyone in your family but you. But it is a special calling because he says, you are my people. I am a, you know, we are a peculiar nation or people to him. So he has called us, but yet he has called us, given us his Holy Spirit to show through our life the virtues of himself. Through his Holy Spirit. What that means is it's no longer our human nature living, but it's Jesus Christ living in us because of our desire to put our trust in God. In one sense, it is fulfilling Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. See, God is going to instruct his people. He's instructing us in the way that we are to walk with him, showing us how to properly set our eye where we can be guided to win the prize that we must obtain in order to be born into the family of God. See, God's not going to let us down concerning his promise towards us. But also God is a God who understands that we are frail at times and that we can sin against him. And through his mercy and patience, he leads us to repentance to put us back on track to where we can draw closer to him. Let's turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 22. 2 Samuel... Chapter 22 and verse 3. Let me move this mat a little bit. There we go. Second Samuel chapter 22, picking up in verse 3, it says, The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. You have saved me from violence. Or we can say that he has saved, he saves us from the injustices that can be put upon us, whether it's through you know, Satan and his demons or whether it's just through the physical nature of what man does. But yet it is a wonderful feeling knowing that we are secure in the hands of God, being protected and held. And we are protected because God holds us from that violence. He protects us from that injustice to provide his safety. 
But it also means that we're not untouchable. It's not something that we should just gloat about because God does give us these trials. But he also is there for us to where he can send his good shepherd, the Jesus, Jesus Christ, to walk us out of our troubles where he can lead and guide. And through our actions that we follow, that Jesus Christ is guiding us from, we are glorifying God. And God, through his trials and through what he does, magnifies himself. As verse 4 says, I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. This is our focal point in life, to continually to praise and to focus on God. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Those are those adversaries, those who can cause us harm. We can read a lot about David and the things and the sufferings and the afflictions that he has gone through. But what happens is, is we also are learning the same lessons through our triumphs and praise that David actually provided with God. We go through those same things. And because of David's faithfulness to God, we have many examples that God has preserved through his scriptures that we can learn today on how God deals with us, his people, showing us how much that we actually need him in our life for direction. And as David celebrated all that God had achieved through him as this willing servant, God also provided David with honor, which is actually the same thing that he does for us today. He gives us this honor by continually trying and testing us so that we become spiritually strong in his knowledge. How God deals with us is how we become strong, showing how much we need him. But also, it applies the understanding, preparing us to be ready to fulfill our role in his kingdom. But yet, for us to have honor, it is something that we have to work towards. It's not something that is just given to us. We must achieve it. We must be honorable ourselves, trustworthy in keeping God's holy days, his commandments, proving to ourselves to God, knowing that through our actions, he sees the desire of our heart. And through that desire, he is pleased in everything that we do. As we continue dropping down in verse 31, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all of them that trust him. So even as this world becomes more and more unhinged, God's always going to give his people this wonderful opportunity to shine. Being the light of the world is a command that he has given us, spreading the gospel of the good news of the kingdom of God through our actions. It's the fruit that God provides and grows in us that it can overflow. And through that fruit, it's showing and producing a different character to others who see it. We call it putting on perfect righteous character. But in reality, we're learning the full nature of God. And we're looking for that day when that full nature becomes and instilled in us. But right at the moment, we are mimicking what God and Jesus Christ do, just like a child mimics his parents. But what it proves to us today is it proves that when we put our trust in God, we do this so that if we put this trust in God, we know then we have to ask ourselves this one question. If we can trust God, then can God trust us? I mean, it sounds a little strange, but can God trust us in what we do that we have committed to him at baptism? See, we have just finished the Feast of Tab Tabernacles. It's been four weeks, and we've learned what God's kingdom is going to look like. We get a little bit more glimpse into it, the responsibilities that we're going to be able to reign and rule alongside Jesus Christ. But yet in six short months, we start this whole process all over again, starting with the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. This quest, brethren, that we are on is to continue preparing ourselves for the role in the kingdom, to see who we are, to see what manner of man or what person we are, what are we made of? And what we are today pictures what we can be tomorrow. God also continues to teach us through his scriptures and through his holy days, but also Sabbath day. It's a day, it's a time that we can come together, that we can talk and reflect on how God has blessed us during the week. It's a way that we can go back and review with one another the basics of God. 
through retaining that excitement that God has, his marvelous plan that he has for us. But yet it's a plan that we should be excited for that man is going to one day understand and where he's going to be able to be continued and one day know the knowledge of God. But yet as we work together learning, we're divining our love and our sacrifice towards God because we are to be living sacrifices. Even when our nature begins to work against God, God knows that we have a lot of physical clutter that we like to store and make issues of. But how we deal with that clutter also can depend on the spiritual issues or how it can affect our spiritual well-being. Because what happens there is we get so wrapped up in things that we lose sight on the meaning why God always tells us, draw close to me. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Scripture that we read usually during the Days of Unleavened Bread, but it's a good time to always reflect because what are we doing from the time that the Feast of Tabernacles ends to Passover? What are we reviewing? In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, it says examine. It means to test yourself. Test yourself or examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Why? I come to services every week. I know people that I talk to. But why are we to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith? We're to have this complete confidence in God, living and resembling this life of Jesus Christ. Because it goes on and says, prove to yourself. Know you not that your own selves, how Jesus Christ is in you, unless you be reprobates? That we just get to the point and we just disqualify ourselves, saying, ah, it's too hard. It's too much work we got to go through. The question we need to ask ourselves is, how are we measuring up to Jesus Christ in our actions in our life on a day-to-day -day basis? We must not forsake what God has done. We must not forsake his love that he has towards us for granted, thinking that he's just going to accept us just the way we are. Because, brethren, we don't want to turn back. We've gone too far. We've worked too hard. That is why we must know ourselves, to know what we are made of and who we are and what do we stand for, staying close to the word of God. So when we do fall, Jesus, being this loving teacher, picks us up, dusts us off, holds us, does what, he, does what he needs to do to give us this wonderful encouragement to set us back on track to where we can succeed. Picking up in verse 6, it says, But I trust that you shall know that you are not reprobates. Jesus Christ is telling us, you are doing it. You just fell down. You didn't disqualify yourself. So don't give up. And we need to know that we know God's truth. Because we never know when we're going to be tested by his truth. Somebody's going to test us, whether it's by a person, whether it's by a trial, or whether it's just by a simple action. See, we're either going to do what we claim to believe in because of our conviction in serving God, or we're going to fall and we're going to become what Satan desires us all to be. We are the delegates of God, proclaiming this good news, this kingdom of God to the world, and showing through our actions this wonderful example that we show to others of that hope that lies in us. And when we put it all together, we can come out and say we are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. But what does that really mean? Well, it means that we're future citizens, we're future kings, we're future priests of the kingdom of God. So are we excited? Are we excited about what God is willing to give us? And all we have, and all we have to do is to endure this little short period of time in our life. And once we endure, we have all eternity with God and Jesus Christ. But we must offer ourselves today as that sacrifice. Jesus Christ's sacrifice, when we look at that, what does that mean? What does it mean to us? Well, yes, he has removed this guilt from us. He's removed this sin, the power of sin from our lives. And he's washed it away with his own blood. But yet we are also eligible or able to serve also because of this in the household of God. To serve one another, to serve God. Jesus Christ paid that penalty for us. And being God's children, his sons, we are also to learn how to associate with those in the world just as Jesus Christ did. Now, what does that really mean? 
to associate. Because we are in this world, but we're not to be of this world. Just as Jesus has done, he was there to set examples. And just think about this for a minute. These trials and these experiences that we go through, how do we learn and to deal with all this confusion and chaos that this world puts on us? Whether you have co-workers or even other family members that don't really understand why you believe what you believe, how are we going to give this wonderful peace, this encouragement to those in need, or being this calm voice, or voice of reason in a storm, when we ourselves have not developed it? That's why we go through these things, where we can remove this mindset of the waves of this world and we put on the very mind of Jesus Christ. Do we know, brethren, who we are? Do we know what we are made of? And do we know what we stand for? Because our actions are always going to be put to the test. We're on trial every day with the world. It's how we show and do we show the nature of God, what we are made of, because that is what resembles the life of Jesus Christ, that we can live a life of righteousness. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. It's one of my favorite verses that I like to go to. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, dropping down to verse 14, where it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, but to put it under the bushel, but on a candlestick, that it will give life unto all that are in the house. See, according to a Google study, if you just type in candlelight or candle study, scientists claim that a human candle this big can be seen with the naked eye of man for about 1.6 miles. 1.6 miles. Now, think about that. Put that into perspective. Here's this little candle flame, and here I am, 5.6. When you put that into perspective, how much are we shining in this world? This light that God is telling us to give out, to be. As verse 16 says, let your light shine. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we learn everything that we do, we do it for what reason? To praise God, to glorify God. He is to be number one in our life and for the reason we live And there should be nothing that we do to replace him from that honor. Anything, brethren, that takes our mind off of serving God and putting it somewhere else, we have to ask and focus, are we breaking a commandment? Because for us to be kings and priests in the future, we have to be in training today. Learning how to make these tough choices by going through these hardships as part of our learning education. It entails how to be a royal family. That's what we're working towards, being royalty, a royal family where we can humbly walk with God, holding true to our commitment and taking hold the responsibility. It is something that no one has forced us to do. We chose this way of life to commit ourselves to God. When you look at Nations who are wealthy, whether they're kings, princes, or even just in those who are very wealthy in the United States. When you look at their children, their children are usually brought up a little bit different way. They're taught how to act from the time that they're born. They're taught how to speak, how to behave, or how they're supposed to behave. Um, A portrait of a different character than those let's say, around them or those who are under them, not trying to criticize or put anybody down, but in one sense, they are kind of elevated above their general consensus of people. It's having this presence of, like I said, setting themselves above others, showing this different character or a different nature than what the status quo would be. All eyes are on them, especially if it's a nation of kings and princesses. The eyes are on them because they're looking for strong leadership. They're looking for guidance in their life. And in most cases, that's how we are to be today. Satan is always going to be out there trying to destroy us, and he constantly accuses us daily. But brethren, we are to be 
what God wants us to be, his people. Let's go over to the book of James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, picking in verse 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entirely wanting nothing. We're lacking nothing because God is working with us and giving us everything that we need. But also, though, what trials show proof of is our level of conversion. The person that stands in each trial righteously gives proof that their conversion is to follow and to stand up or to stand in the gap for God. The evidence shows this wonderful sound mind that we don't just fly off the handle like most people do. It produces courage and having patience waiting to be delivered while preserving the knowledge of God. So we do not just put our hand to the prow and look back at what type of life we've just left. We should have no desire to go back to that way of life. God has delivered us out of it. But we should continue to look forward, marching on our knees, looking, seeking first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, because through God's righteousness, that is really the only way that we can seek God and to walk humbly with him. It's called giving God the glory, giving him the honor that is due, the best way that we understand because we are all, in one sense, unique in the eyes of God. God's way is not complex, like so many other religions like to make it look like. God's way is not complex. It's actually, in one sense, it's very simple. It's what causes this problem with mankind is that we want to make something out of something that's not there or make something bigger out of something that's not there. We know what the future holds for us, but brethren, do we actually rejoice in that? God always provides what we need. And he always provides it at the exact time. I heard a quote one time that God loves cliffhangers, and it just kind of stuck. Because God really wants to know when we're at the edge of the cliff, what are we going to do? He wants to know what we are going to do and if we're going to stand up for him. Where we can get all this knowledge, this information, and to learn the lesson at the very last minute of time. Even when this lesson is, could be just the example of being humiliated by somebody from the world or in the world. It's a lesson that we learn. Let's go back to the book of 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And dropping down to verse 12. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12, it says, For our rejoicing is this. Now, when you read verses 1 through 11, it basically, in context, it talks about how God comforts in trials. So we know that for our rejoicing is this, it's being comforted. When we rejoice, God comforts. The testimony of our conscience. This is this action or this firmness that we stand for. That in simplicity, that is the quality or condition of being easy to understand or to do. And we do it in godly sincerity. Righteousness is how we are to do it. As it continues to say, it's not done in this fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. And we have had our conversation. Does it mean how we talk to one another? Is that what it means? It has a little bit, but basically what it's actually representing is it's this godly example that we have left behind. Because it says, we had our conversations in the world and more abundantly towards you. So we've leave these godly examples to the world. And if they're important to God to say you are to leave these examples, how much more important is it that we leave them with one another here? Because the knowledge which God has given us, we have to define it. And in some cases, we have to define it the best way because we're all on different levels where we can conduct ourselves and show our love to God. 
while we overcome this world and its influences. See, we're to be holy. We're to be true in the eyes of God and not full of the wisdom of the flesh. God has called us to be his sons. Those who are led of the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. He's called us to be his sons, or we can look at it as saying his children today. But his children are to be servants, serving one another and carrying on the reputation of the family name. That means being steadfast in faith. Knowing the afflictions that we suffer help make us perfect before God. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. I'm picking up in verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. So basically, we know he's out there, but what are we to do? It says, whom resist? We need to resist Satan, but it also, we're to be steadfast in the faith that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We're not alone, brethren. We all have afflictions and different trials that we go through. All of us have been called from God from all corners of the world. And we all suffer together. We all learn in one sense together. That's why when one member suffers, we all suffer for that member. When one rejoices, we rejoice. But yet we all suffer. Whether it might be through sickness, through disease, through trial, through tribulation, through death, depression, or anything else that Satan may throw at us, we are to resist and seek God. This life that we live, brethren, is just a little moment of time. As verse 10 says, But the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you what? Perfect. Established. Strengthened. Settled you. We're complete. And we're looking for that day we really are complete and born into God's family. We're going to be like Jesus Christ when he returns and we are changed. So the question is, we can see we can trust God, that he's going to do everything he says. Because he's always remains faithful to us. And we should never lose our confidence in God or to give up to where we just want to throw everything away. We've worked too hard for it. We need to take our salvation seriously. But also, if we can place our trust in God, another question that comes up, can God trust us then to do what we committed to do? Well, let's look at some of the trust that God has for his people. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6 and picking up in verse 12. We're told in 1 Timothy 6 verse 12, fight the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life whereto you are also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. We are not to be conflicted in our thoughts. We are to know, once again, who we are, what we stand for, where God is leading us to victory, to receive our crown of righteousness. Continuing in verse 13, it says, I give you charge in the sight of God who quicken all things and before Christ Jesus, who has before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good profession. Now, I understand this is referring to what went wrong with, with Jesus Christ, but who are we supposed to be mimicking? Who are we supposed to be living like? Jesus Christ stayed true to the Father's will, and we are also. And are we we're fulfilling our role that God has given us to fulfill? Verse 14 says that you keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we read that, we should, are we thinking about we're willing to do whatever it takes to please our Father? We're going to do whatever His will says that it's going to be done. As Christ said, not my will, but your will. To be unmoved from the ways of this world, 
we basically are going to be unmoved from, I'm sorry, we're going to be unmoved from God's way to where the world isn't going to sway us. And we can see and look forward to the day that Jesus Christ does return and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Because this gospel that we are living, do we hold dear to it? How far are we willing to go to defend it? Brethren, we're to play to win, like sports professionals play to win this earthly prize. And we read about what Paul writes. They give and win this crown that by next year it's no good anymore because somebody else has it. We're we're working hard for a crown of victory that's going to last for all eternity that no one can take away. So then it comes back to lead us to another question. Do we really appreciate what God and Jesus Christ continually do for us? We are to be, we're to remove anything from our life that does not resemble God. And each year, we have this opportunity to go back, to study our notes, from starting from Passover all the way to the Feast of Tabernacles. And is it something that after the feast is over and during this time we shut the book up and we never read him or never go back to it? Because we need to remain excited what God is doing. So when we do start over in six months, we can measure ourselves and look at how much we have learned from one year to the next. So we're to remove everything that does not resemble Jesus Christ and God. And measure our spiritual well-being to see how much we have grown in God's knowledge. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter, chapter 1, and picking up in verse 9. In one sense, this is kind of a warning for us. But in 2 Peter 1, verse 9, it says, But he that lacks these things. Well, when you look that up, what is it actually referring? He who does not increase in knowledge. We're just kind of just here. It says, He who lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten what he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence and make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. So brethren, do we have this vision to see this big picture? And do we keep that vision alive? A scripture that comes to mind really quick is found over here in Revelation chapter 21, where we have the warning, but then we have a reward here. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7. It says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So we need to stay committed to finish the race that we have started. As going back, forgot to tell you to keep your finger, but going back to 2 Peter chapter 1 and picking up in verse 11. 2 Peter 1 verse 11, it says, For so an entrance shall, an entrance shall be ministered, or it shall be opened, like a door opened unto you abundantly in everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we are going to receive all these abundant blessings that God desires to give to those who seek after his righteousness. Bringing this to a close, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and in verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore... Brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable servant, service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed of the renewing of your mind that you shall prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. After reading that, it comes back. How far and to what extent are we willing, once again, to please God? For if we are doing what our Father teaches us to do, then God's going to have trust in us because it's about his will and what he desires for this whole manner. This desire that we have is to please God 
to where God can trust us because he knows what we are willing to sacrifice for him. As Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5 says, He that overcomes, he who prevails, he who obtains this victory, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That's going to be holy and pure. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. What an exciting time that is going to be. So one final scripture of trust that God uses to enhance and strength to his own children is found in the book of Genesis chapter 22. When you think of strength and the trust that God has, it kind of puts it all together. Genesis chapter 22. You know the story. It's the passage of Abraham and Isaac. We're going to start in verse 2, and I'm just going to paraphrase for lack of time. But picking up in verse 2, we see that where God is speak, speaking to Abraham and offering sacrifice, where he says, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. In verse 3, he says, Abraham rose up early that morning. Dropping down to verse 6, Abraham took the wood, he took a knife, he took uh, what he needed for the burnt offering, and he took all of that with him, and they departed and went on their way. As verse 7 says, Isaac spoke to him and said, Father, and he says, here I am. And he says, behold the fire, the wood, but where is this lamb? Where is this burnt offering? Verse 8 says, Abraham says to him, God's going to provide himself one. He's going to provide the lamb. Verse 9 is where we want to begin. And then came to the place which God told him of. And Abraham built the altar there. And he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him upon the altar and of, upon the wood. What we see is there's no struggling. There's no fight. You have the will of the Father obeying the Heavenly Father. You see the physical Son obeying the physical Father. It's the same as Jesus Christ and God the Father. There is no argument. It's about the will. The will of the Father, the will of the Son. And in one sense, we can look at it. Abraham, in his mind already knew that he was dead. You come to that conclusion. As Abraham stretched out forth his hand and he took this knife to slay his son, stopping right there and just imagine what that looked like. The faith that he had to do, what God required of him. What was he thinking? Some could say, and I've, I've heard people say this, that, well, God spoke to them back in the old days, so it's easier to have faith. Really? God speaks to us on a day-to-day -day basis through his Holy Spirit and his word. And we're to speak back to God through prayer. So what does that have to do with it? We need to have the faith to follow what God has told us to do. As verse 11 says, Then the angel of the Lord appears, called upon out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He says, Lay not a hold on the lad, neither do anything upon him. Because what does he say? Now I know. God does the same for us. He gives us these trials because he wants to know we are going to fulfill his will. The trust that God has in Abraham to fulfill is that same trust that he has for us. It's that same passion that God wants from us, his people, to trust in his way to fulfill his will to have the reverence, the fear, to serve and to please him to the best of our ability, keeping his laws close to our heart, keeping his actions or the actions that we do glorify him to where we can define the manner of person and to carry out the likeness of God in our own life. So brethren, may we be truly thankful for what God continues to do for us knowing that we have this wonderful opportunity to inherit all things and spend the rest of our entire eternal existence with God and Jesus Christ. But before that time comes, this little span that we have today, may we continue asking God to where we can receive the blessings that God has in store for those that he calls his children 
today.